Welcome to today's webinar, Effective Engagement, How Motivational Interviewing Can Help Engage Adolescents in Primary Care, provided through a collaboration between the Pennsylvania Medical Home Initiative, a program of the Pennsylvania Chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics, and funded by the Pennsylvania Department of Health. This webinar by Dr. Saha aims to obtain a better understanding of the importance of motivational interviewing and effectively assisting in promoting behavior change. It also allows us to be able to identify the specific skills that are essential for motivational interviewing and to understand the relevance of staff-wide training and office culture change in the development of an effective en environment that promotes behavior change. Please allow me to introduce myself. My name is Renee Turchi, and I am a pediatrician at St. Christopher's Hospital for Children and medical director of the Pennsylvania Medical Home Initiative with Eileen Thompson. This webinar is recorded. The recording will be available by the Pennsylvania Medical Home Initiative and will be posted on the University of Pittsburgh Internet-Based Studies and Education and Research website. For CME purposes, please be advised that both Dr. Saa and I have no disclosures. Please note that the information presented in this webinar is educational in nature and does not necessarily represent the views or policies of the Pennsylvania chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics or their funders. Now, please allow me to introduce Dr. Saha. Dr. Prantik Saha graduated from Case Western Reserve University Medical School and completed a pediatrics residency at Johns Hopkins Hospital. He started practicing general pediatrics initially as a hospitalist and later in primary care. Dr. Saha spent 11 years as a faculty member at Columbia University Medical Center where he completed his master's in public health at the Columbia Mailman School of Public Health and currently practices primary care pediatrics at a group faculty practice in New York City. After attending several motivating interviewing workshops, he joined the Motivational Interviewing Network of Trainers, the MINT, in 2010. Dr. Saha spends about 25 to 30 percent of his work life in medical education, and his interests include providing motivational interviewing training for primary care providers, medical students, and trainees. A sampling of past participants and audiences include graduate and health professional students at the Institute of Human Nutrition at Columbia University Medical Center, peer education counselors from the community-based organizations and community campus partnerships, as well as medical students and pediatric residents at Columbia University Medical Center. Dr. Saha is faculty member of the Columbia HIV Mental Health Training Project and has been a visiting professor for the American Academy of Pediatrics section on obesity. His current focus is on the development of a motivational interviewing curriculum for medical students. We are delighted to have Dr. Saha present on this timely and important topic for primary care clinicians. Dr. Saha, you may begin your presentation. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. You, I am assuming everyone can hear me. Uh, I'm calling from a, you know, another phone line. So uh, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for having me uh, present on motivational interviewing. Um, I, as was said before, I think it's very important, uh, very uh, timely uh, in all sorts of different realms of clinical practice, um, and especially in adolescence. And that's kind of where it's one of the main places where I use it as a pediatrician. So, um, as I have, as I just said before, I have no disclosures or conflicts of interest, and uh, so let, let me just give you a little. Uh, uh, an outline of the agenda. Uh, we kind of lost a few minutes there, so I'm going to try to speed through it as much as possible, but at the same time, you know, hopefully uh, give a little time to think, think in. So um, I'm going to start with a little bit of didactic, okay, and that's going to include just a short overview of MI. Um, you know, the three slides, they, they might be a little busy, but we'll, we'll, we'll go through them. And just to be able to, for you to have the language you know, some of the language that we use for this. And then uh, I'll give a slide on the latest research, um, in particular with respect to human papillomavirus vaccination. And, and then we'll do two case studies where I think that's going to be the bulk of the presentation and I think uh, we can see how MI can be effective in these, these two cases. All right. So first I want to talk about a very simple term. We call it change time. Okay. Um, what is change? It is any expression from the patient of their own desires, their ability, their reasons, and possibly their need for behavior change. Example would be, for example, hey, I like partying, but sometimes the mornings are rough. Okay. And so there, there's some, there's some 
expression of how problematic a behavior might be. Um, and so that we would call change talk. That's in contrast to sustained talk, which is the opposite. Patients' expression of their own desires, reasons, need to stay the same, and includes the inability to change. So, for example, actually, the mornings are not so bad. And um, you can imagine that with different patients and different scenarios, there's, you know, you can come up with lots of different possible change talk as well as sustained talk. The main thing, though, is that talk comes from the patient, not from you. Okay, as a provider. This is, when we talk about change talk, we're talking about what can we elicit from the patient? What can we reinforce in the patient? Yeah. So, okay, that's change talk. And then I'm going to talk about, this is a recent kind of uh, uh, concept with motivational interviewing uh, that I think is kind of interesting, um, just in terms of what the processes are. Okay, so we have engaging focusing, evoking, and planning. Now you can imagine that with engaging, that's kind of like a process you need to do regardless of what you're doing. So you're taking a history, um, you're just giving information, you're going through your thoughts about uh, the, the diagnosis, you have to have someone engaged, right? And it's also important to have them focus, you know, to, to have that uh, uh, not be, you know, all sorts of different tangents in different directions. So we would say that engaging and focusing is necessary for MI, but it's not really what makes MI MI. Um, what really makes it is when you start to evoke, evoke change talk in particular. And ultimately, sometimes you get to planning, sometimes you don't, but that would certainly be under the, the heading of motivation. Okay, so this is, very, this is a more general view of what's happening during MI. Now, here's a, for those of you who've gotten some exposure to MI, this is a very common diagram we like to show. And um, basically, the way I like to look at it is these are kind of uh, styles that you have, right? So, so following would be, uh, I always seem to think about it in, in terms of psychoanalysis, like traditional psychoanalysis, where you, know, you have the patient or the client in a, in a recliner, uh, you know, sofa, um, facing the window, looking outside, and just talking. And then the therapist or the practitioner is behind them, not making eye contact, but just writing down notes, you know, completely following the patient. Okay. Then there's directing, which is probably something we uh, are uh, accustomed to doing, which is kind of like, listen, this is what you got to do. This is what's important. I really need you to do this. Um, I mean, those would be the extremes of directing, but it, it, it really does involve, like, you being a little bit in the direction. Okay? And then there's something in the middle called guiding, okay? And it's kind of a not completely directing, not completely following. It's a kind of a mixture of both, right? So let's talk a little bit about these three different styles uh, uh, in depth. So the following... I mean, as opposed to the extreme example I gave you, in MI, what, what we really mean is you are empathic. Empathic, again, is just to, you know, clarify it for people. Sometimes there can be some, uh, not controversies, but disagreements with what it really means. But it really means trying to feel, uh, trying to understand where your patient is coming from. Uh, we always use the term, you know, put, put yourself in their shoes. So if you put yourself in their shoes, what would you be feeling if this was happening to you? What would you be thinking if this was happening? Um, and then trying to match it with what your patient says. Uh, so that's empathy. And then there's two other concepts called acceptance and rolling of resistance. So um, acceptance would be, you know, ex ex accepting your patient. And probably the best way to exemplify that is that you accept them unconditionally. It means you take care of them unconditionally. Uh, you may not agree with what they say, but you still accept them. And it's not as though the disagreement might not present itself in the discussion because it might be helpful for the patient to hear a different uh, perspective from you. Uh, but you don't reject the patient. Um, you're, you're, you have a, an accepting, non-judgmental uh, kind of tone and uh, 
suppression. Corrosion resistance is, is similar, and um, it's, it's, it's kind of part of that. It's like accepting in the face of um, a patient that might be resistant to what you're suggesting or resistant to change in general. All right, that's following. Now, directing uh, an MI would be uh, where you might give information, and there's ways to give that information. We're going to talk about that. And then, like I had mentioned before, eliciting or reinforcing change star. Um, and uh, what we have with guiding is, is what I like to put here is kind of like the, the uh, micro skills. Okay, open-ended questions, affirmations, reflections, summaries. These are these are kind of like moment-to-moment -moment steps that you can take in the conversation that help you um, in both directions. Okay, reflections tend to help with patients feeling accepted and empathized with. Um, open-ended, but reflections can also be used to kind of reinforce change talk. Um, and the same goes with with uh, the other microscope. So now the thing is, is uh, as I mentioned before, guiding is actually some skillful, selective use of directing and following. Um, depends on the circumstance. So in, appro in approaching patients who are resistant or challenging, you might need to do more of this. That's and that's part of the engagement process, right? And then once you kind of have them on board you can become a little bit more selectively directed. Um, key thing is that there's, you know, directive would be, an MI again, it would be, it would be this. And uh, we'll talk more about that in the, in the cases. So just to give you a little bit of, uh, just a couple of papers that have uh, come out very recently this year um, with regards to human papillomavirus in, in particular. Um, and there's uh, this study is really more of a kind of a feasibility study, but to some degree, uh, also just provider acceptance of uh, MI and the use of HPV vaccine counseling, um, and it, it was really looked up looked upon favorably. Uh, this was an actual study that showed increased uh, initiation and completion of the series in adolescents. So. Um, there's actually a lot of research when it comes to MI vaccines in general, um, but because of HPV being a particular issue, since it's not required for school, and and um, you know, there's, a, there's all these uh, concerns about safety on the part of different communities and parents, uh, you know, this is now being looked at specifically. All right. All right, so let's do a case presentation. Um, let me just read through it. Uh, hopefully, this is something that kind of resonates with, you, with all of you, and we'll see this. You are seeing a 15-year-old male adolescent for an annual checkup. The mother is in the waiting room while you and he are in the exam room. You notice that he is up to date on his immunization, with the exception of HPV. Of course, you guys never get this problem, right? <laughs> he has never received, he hasn't received any doses, um, and you, you know you talk with him more. He states that he has a girlfriend who is he has been with for the last six months. They have had reciprocated oral sex, but no vaginal or anal intercourse. They are not intending on either of those uh, soon. You counsel him about birth control and safer sex practices, and he seems confident in his knowledge of these issues. Yeah, you know, I, I, I went to health class. I don't, I don't know what that's about. You don't have to tell me about that. Um, he's determined to use condoms every time. In your discussion with him, he seems hesitant about HPV immunization, in particular because he doesn't like needles, he doesn't want shots. Then he says, you know, it, it, you got to stop my mother. She's, she's the one that was really against those things. You know, you her. All right, so how would you approach this patient? As, um, and uh, I mean, typically, if I was doing this in a more interactive uh, environment, I would kind of elicit from all of you what you would do, what your first thoughts are. Um, and most people would think about like, you know, providing some information, um, et cetera, et cetera. So let's do this. Let's do a little multiple choice, OK? <laughs> um, just three possibilities uh, here. Does your mother know about your girlfriend? <laughs> uh, 
Uh, very helpful question. No, I don't think so. Um, how about, okay, fine. I'll just check in with you about this next year. Um, and then there's C. Let me tell you about he, how you can get infected with HPV and what the consequences be. So um, yeah, I wish I could get a, like a some kind of visualization of how many hands, but you know, what do you think would be the most appropriate response is, uh, response of these three. Uh, and in general, I, I think people kind of uh, look to number to C. Now I'm going to offer another answer, which is none of the above. That there's some other way that we can do this. This goes straight into giving information. How about if we did something else, a little different? How about starting with the patient's view and perspective? You have some, you've gotten some of it, right? Um, but remember I talked about empathy and reflection, and so what about a possible reflection? How would you reflect on this? And again, in a, in a more interactive position, I would literally ask you guys what kind of reflective statement you make. Believe it or not, it's sometimes difficult to come up with a reflective statement because we're not used to doing that. We're used to asking questions and telling. So, um, and it's Difficult to me, it's difficult for me to this day. I have to consciously put myself in that boat. So what is it like in a shoot? It sounds like you are not crazy about needles. At the same time, you want to make sure you stay healthy. Um, and the idea behind that is that you, um, you, you're showing active listening. Like, listen, I'm listening to you. I'm, I'm really sincerely trying to understand where you, where you come from. And, uh, and that's what this accomplishes. And that's helpful for patients in terms of engagement um, and feeling like they can uh, uh, actually in, uh, divulge more. And there's another type of response you can give, or in addition, affirmation. And I see you are very determined to ensure you and your girlfriend are safe. Um, the, the, sometimes the line between reflections and affirmations is uh, is a little blurry, um, but the idea is that you're, um, you're not necessarily praising, but you're noting their strengths. You know, you're, you're noting uh, what is um, a trait that they have that they had a goal for and that they're sticking to. Sometimes it also is what what happened in the past that they were able to do to them, right? So that's another statement you can make. Again, it's focusing on the positive. It helps boost patients' efficacy, their own feelings of self-efficacy. And then you could have, then you could follow it with a question. Uh, instead of let me tell you uh, more about HPV, what do you know about this infection? What do you know about genital warts? What do you know about cancer in young people? Like you? Just kind of getting, uh, getting their information first. So starting with the patient's perspective, right? Reflecting, affirming it. And then finding out where they are. This is this is also a type of evoking. It's a little bit more about just evoking more of their perspective. Um, so you could get that. And let's say you, uh, and then at that point, let's say they you know, they give you some information. They, they kind of say they don't really know, <laughs> which you know, um, I don't, don't know about oral cancer and and cervical cancer. Um, so then this is a time where you can say, let me tell you more about HPV if that's okay. Make sure to ask for permission. It's a very, it's a very simple um, uh, rule. It doesn't have to be explicitly followed every single moment um, because it does get tiresome to ask for permission every single moment that you're going to give information. But I would say it's helpful to just know that it's in, that you get a sense that it is um, that the patient is open. To the information, They're, they want to receive this information, um, and asking for permission helps confirm that, and gives them some power. Right? So, would it be okay if I shared some information about this infection, this vaccine, whatever you will? And then you give a small, digestible, relevant amount of information. Okay. So, this vaccine helps protect you and your sexual partners from getting cancer, which is true. Which is yeah, that's the, the biggest impetus, right? Um, and then you ask for their feedback. So 
often we give information, sometimes it has to be a large voluminous amount of information. I'm guilty of it myself. Um, to try to stop yourself and just begin with them. Like, what do, what do they think of that? You know, where does that put them? Um, so let's say you discuss this more. Additionally, you discuss the link between HDV and oral cancer, as well as its relevance for both males and females. You may also, you know, this cervical cancer thing, I mean, why do I need to be worried about that? You know, uh, he may not, you know, <laughs> he may not have a public health perspective like the rest of us do. <laughs> so um, you have to try to make it relevant to him, and, uh, you know, you certainly can do that. Oral cancer, they're having oral sex. Um, so, you know, that, that's a, probably a very relevant point. Your patient is surprised by the information, but is still unsure about receiving uh, the HPV vaccine. He states, well, anyway, the mother has to be okay with it. And then you bring the mother into the room after the exam uh, with him. Uh, you, could, you could have it with, with, uh, uh, with him or just one-on-one. -on -one. I like to have them together um, for, for, uh, for this kind of thing. Uh, with the intention of having a conversation about HPV vaccine with the patient. How would you approach this mother? What would be, you know, the first thing that you might say or ask once you got the mother? Okay. So we're going to do the multiple choice again, and I'm going to try not to be humorous here, but let's see. So A, do you know that your son has a girlfriend? Don't worry, they are not having intercourse yet. Um, <laughs> all right, I guess I, I can't stop with my humor here. Um, I know I know that you've been opposed to the HP, HPV vaccination, so we don't need to discuss this unless you change your mind. All right, next. Um, and then finally, let me tell you about how you can get infected with HPV, uh, how one gets infected with HPV, and what the consequences might be. And then, of course, I'm adding to none of the, none of the above, like I did before. Instead of jumping into giving information, we want to know a little bit more of what she thinks. So I know we have discussed HPV immunization in the past, uh, and I, I understand you're opposed to it. I'm curious, do you mind telling me more about your perspective at this point? Okay. Um, the mother states that she has heard about cases where people experience permanent, profound neurologic effects, and also, how important is this anyway? I didn't receive all these immunizations, and I turned out fine. So something none of us ever hear, right? Um, <laughs> so what can we do so we can reflect that? As much as we might inside roll our eyes, um, I think having a very sincere, I'm hearing you, I'm listening to you. And you know what? If we didn't have the information that we have now as providers and we were in her place, you know, we might sincerely believe that. Um, one thing to keep in mind, this is actually, I just want to go on a little bit of a tangent because I think it's important. One thing to keep in mind is, um, uh, is it justified for some communities or just people in general to be suspicious of healthcare? Well, you know, when it comes to this, it's like, you know, it's, there's, there's kind of no question. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty uh, you know, uh, open and shut case with vaccination. But have there been times in, in history when medical care was something that was uh, problematic um, ethically? Of course. You know, just look at the Tuskegee experiment. You know, I, I uh, saw that film. I forgot the name of the film. But anyway, it's a, it's a beautiful film. There's books written in, uh, on it. And it's a very, very sad uh, uh, portion of our history with medicine where for decades people were forbidden to receive treatment for syphilis. Uh, black men, in particular, a group of black men, and papers were published left and right about it, uh, meaning like the information they gained. So, you know, if let's say this patient, this, you know, patient was uh, African American, a uh, person of color, I can imagine that they might be a little suspect, you know, and I can understand that. I, I can kind of feel like where that's coming from. Um, so you might, it might require having that kind of feeling sometimes when dealing with patients who are kind of definitely very diff having a different perspective than we might have. 
So it can be scary to hear about those kind of serious effects back to your child. Right? Uh, true statement. Okay, let's see. Affirmation. You're determined to keep your son as free from harm as possible. You're being, you know, you're she's acting as, as a good parent. You know, she's being she's uh, being thoughtful. She wants to do her due diligence. All right, and then, and then we can start saying, hey, you know, now that I've heard you, now that you've heard that I've heard you, now that you've heard that I'm not going to be judgmental. That's the other. That's the other thing about reflections and affirmations. It's, that it's about kind of explicitly informing them, hey, you don't have to worry about judgment from me. Um, then you can give some information. You ask for permission, give some information, you ask for feedback. And, and for example, um, uh, 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 you, know, you can give anything in terms of information. What I wanted to point out actually was more the uh, this model, the elicit, elicit uh, meaning eliciting, eliciting permission, provide a little information, and then elicit feedback. Um, very common concept. Uh, there's also other ways to discuss this. Uh, chunk, check, no, check, chunk, check. Sometimes, sometimes people would like to use that too. Um, so you, you can give her any kind of information that you feel might be effective. If you want to talk about studies, if you want to talk about what you did with your child, if you want to you know talk about uh, your experience with it, if you want to talk about cerebral cancer, um, anybody in your family have cancer. Uh, might be a good question to ask in terms of listed, uh, eliciting change talk. So, the mother appreciates the information, and she's concerned about cervical cancer as well as genital warts. She is now more ambivalent about whether she should trust the information uh, that she receives from the internet, Dr. Google. So, let's say you'd summarize this, kind of, and this is where uh, a summary could be. So as a diligent parent, we need to be certain that any medical treatments we offer are not only important but also safe. You've done your research and you see different perspectives. On the one hand, you're not sure how important this vaccine is, and on the other hand, you are very concerned about preventing common cause consequences with HPV uh, like cancer and genital warts. What do you think you would like to do with this? So this is kind of like a way to help them process, you know, kind of collecting what the positives of vaccination might be for them, what the negatives might be, and and see where they want to go. You know, part of it is kind of like unraveling the knot of ambivalence to spell it out for them like this, um, and it can be helpful uh, moving forward in the conversation. So let's say she says, well. I think I still want to think about it. I, I don't want him to get the back. All right? Now, how would you approach her now? What would you do now? Um, you know, you've gotten to this point. You feel like you've made some inroads. And then suddenly, she kind of jumps back a little bit, right? Um, so we're going to do another multiple choice. <laughs> um, and uh, basically, I just have uh, you know a series of buts, mainly because I think the common reaction is something that we call the writing reflex. We want to make something right. We want to uh, we want to fix it. So, you know, she took a few steps back. So you want to fix it? I think, but you know, cervical cancer is cervical cancer is dangerous. You know, uh, oral cancer, genital warts are also dangerous. But you know, I told you that there's no studies that have shown that there's an association between permanent neurologic uh, deficits and this vaccine. So you could you could do a lot of buts, right? You could sit there and just go through all the different buts. And um, but what happens there when you're using the writing reflex is that you're becoming argumentative. Um, and when you become argumentative, then she starts to think. You know, your patient might start to think, "Are you judging me? Are you?" not happy with my decision? Well, you might not be happy with my decision. I, I, I misspoke. Maybe like, you don't accept my decision. Um, do I have to see another doctor? It could, it could go in many other, you know, in many other ways. Um, but introducing that element of very mild judgment can, can, it can kind of ruin the MI that you've done, you know, I would say. So what do we do? 
let's talk about acceptance and rolling with resistance. You can see that she's somewhat resistant, and you know, remember what I said, unconditional acceptance. So this is a statement that you could potentially pose to her. Okay, well, at the end of the day, it is up to you what you want, what you would like to do. You're his mother, after all. Okay, you make the decision. How would you feel if we check in about this at the next point? Like, for example, you know, if it's now, you're going to come in in a couple of months for the flu shot. Why don't we talk about it then? <laughs> Provided she doesn't have any problems with the flu shot, <laughs> which is the subject of another webinar. Um, and we certainly talk, and we can certainly talk about it before then, if you'd like, in case you have any more questions or thoughts. All right, and I like to pose this because this is not a very um, uh, naturally cultivated thing to do in the in the field of healthcare, in the field of, of being a healthcare provider, and certainly being a physician. You know, we, I don't. You know, I was never taught this in medicine. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to change that now, but you know, uh, I was never taught this concept of you know, patients have autonomy, and we have to you know accept their autonomy in this kind of situation. Of course, now there is a lot of change with regards to. Uh, for example, in, in situations of palliative care, et cetera, where that's changing. So, but I wanted to give you that example because that's very important. Um, the acceptance, believe it or not, actually, it, so it lowers their resistance. They go back to feeling like, okay, you're on my side. You're trying to collaborate with me. And it actually helps lead to change, ultimately. Because otherwise, those resistance barriers just stay up there. Um, and that's what the mother will be feeling at the forefront of her consciousness. So if we can kind of eliminate, if we can kind of loosen that resistance, she'll be more open to what we say. Let me go through a second case. We're going to do this. I see I have 15 minutes, so I'm going to uh, go through this fairly quickly, um, and we'll see what you guys think. You're seeing a 19-year-old woman in clinic because she is here for follow-up. She is sexually active with one male partner, but he's not used condoms. You have a discussion with her about safer sex practices to prevent STIs. She seems to understand, but is hesitant about using condoms. All right. So just to cut to the chase, you know, you want to learn more. You get, you know, uh, a, a better impression of her perspective. So you get this. She hasn't spoken with her partner about using condoms, but he often talks about how great the sex is. She says that he does not have sex with other people, but she is not sure. What other questions would you ask? Um, and so to kind of cut kind of to the chase, I wanted to show you uh, one kind of strategy that you can use. This is called the decisional matrix. It's actually kind of fallen in disfavor uh, in recent years in motivational interviewing, um, only because uh, people are using it just by itself. And if it's used with some way of evoking change talk, then, um, then it can be useful. And all it is is examining the pros and cons. But it's examining them in a very uh, specific way. So because we use this as like a status quo, or staying in the habit, which in this case would be staying in the relationship, not challenging the current sexual habits. And then change would be breaking, either breaking from this relationship or beginning to use protection, all right? And then what are the pros of, of that? What are the cons of that? What are the pros of uh, changing? Uh, and what are the cons of that? And of course, you know, the pros of the status quo and the cons of changing are probably similar and vice versa, all right? So, and you can even draw this out. I, 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 I like drawing this out sometimes for adolescents and say, all right, what's gonna be in this box, you know? And then what's going to be in this box? And so on and so forth. So this is what she says. Not using a condom makes him happy. And I like it when he's happy. Well, what about the not so good things about staying the way it's staying the course? I'm not sure I like the sex. I'm the one who calls him all the time just to hang out. He never calls me. What would happen if uh, you did make a change? How would, what would be the good thing? I don't know. I guess I won't feel like a fool calling him all the time. What would be the downside? Well, I might be lonely. All of my friends have boyfriends. So, you know, I'm a little worried that I'll be left out. 
right? Uh, so then, what do you do next? And again, you could do a reflection. You want to make sure that you're safe. It's kind of a, uh, you know, it, it, the idea there is you're trying to bring out her strength. So her strength is is that she's ambivalent about this. She's not saying, no, I'm totally fine. I don't need to make a change. She's considering it because she she's doing it in the interest of her safety. This is a you know this is a an important efficacious self-efficacious thing to do. You're struggling with how to protect your relationship as well as your own health. That's a statement that helps in terms of like it, sometimes it's like the glass is half empty or the glass is half full. So you can look at this as uh, obviously you wouldn't say this, but you can imagine feelings that might arise on on the part of ourselves that we that would be like, oh come on, it's just crazy. You don't even enjoy it that, and you've got to stop this. He's <coughs> He's uh, taking advantage of it. Um, uh, but then you can also look at it in, in the flip side, that she she may be taking advantage of, but she's also struggling with how to protect that relationship, whatever good there might be there, as well as her own health. And then you can ask a question that would then elicit change talk. The previous open questions were really more about getting her perspective. Uh, and now you can ask something like this. If you feel free to be able to ask or tell us how you really feel, what would you say? What kind of situation would you want? And the other thing about this question is a uh, topic of not only just the, uh, <laughs> another webinar, but probably a whole curriculum, which is uh, intimate partner violence screening. Uh, this is a great way to get into that, like how do you guys handle disagreements, et cetera. And you can also ask, just not thinking about him in particular, but what would you want as an ideal relationship? What would it look like? You know, imagining what that would be, what that would be. And you know, this is with the hypothesis that well, she's and she's not happy in this relationship to some degree. Uh, there are things that bother her. So what would be that? Um, so so that that's kind of one uh, another strategy that. You know, so, wow, I can't believe it. I still have 10 minutes. So uh, hopefully we'll get some questions. Um, some of my final thoughts are, I like to think of MI as like the best practice for behavior change counseling. Um, it is not a guarantee. Okay, so it's not, I mean, you know, amoxicillin for group A strep. That's like almost guaranteed, almost, right? Um, this is this is not necessarily that at all, not even close. Uh, it kind of depends upon what stage they're in. I didn't talk about the trans theoretical model or behavior change, but uh, one way to look at the patient's perspective, your client's perspective, is to use that model. You can certainly use this. Um, it, it's kind of helpful. Um, you know, are they pre-contemplation or contemplation? Um, and within contemplation, there's actually even different gradations of contemplation. They could be contemplating how much of a problem something is. They could be contemplating how important or desirous they are to make a change. And they could be contemplating how confident or capable they are that they can make this change. So, and you can target the counseling there. But again, but what I'm saying with, uh, with regards to not being a guarantee is that your patient could be pre-contemplative. Right? They don't think it's a problem. Um, so they may not change then. They may not change for months. They may not, the timeline for behavior change is their timeline. You know, uh, I, I often talk about how our timeline, well, it's pretty strict, right? We got, I don't know, 15 minutes per patient, 30 minutes per patient. You got to see this many patients. That's our timeline. Right? Their timeline with behavior change is not going to fit that timeline. Um, so we have to acknowledge that. We have to uh, be accepting of that. Um, at the same time, using MI, you know, having MI there helps them ultimately, even if they're pre-contemplated in the long, long run. Um, and this is where it's actually helpful to have the whole practice uh, trained in MI. Because then, 
the patient, it's not just the sole doctor who is treating them with respect and collaborating with them, but also kind of gently, you know, selectively directing by evoking change talk. But it's everybody. It's the nurse. It's the MA. It's the, it's the staff in the front. And uh, I, I remember in my, when I first started practicing online, when I was first getting trained in it, I, I was at a, at a clinic where, um, you know, I was the only person who was talking about MI, I was the only person practicing it. And, <laughs> you know, I would, I would have a discussion. It's actually based on the last case with, uh, with the patient about uh, safer sex practices and sexually transmitted infections. And uh, as soon as I went out of the room, the MA would go in and uh, show pictures of what gonorrhea looks like and what syphilis looks like and try to scare her. And I was just like, oh, come on. You just like defeated everything I said. Um, uh, so, but, um, but yeah, so I think that, uh, I think having it be like a staff-wide culture, you know, even a culture, I think it can be tremendously helpful. In case this ends up being a question, I'm going to um, also put a couple of resources I want to talk about. Uh, yes, Dr. Sa, how do we integrate uh, motivational interviewing with all of the checklists that we have that we have to do throughout the day? <laughs> it's a, that's a great question. And that's the question, that's like the, the leading question that I get um, when it comes to integrating MI in the realm of primary care or actually any, uh, much of medical care. MI was born, it was, it was really kind of termed and uh, described by two uh, psychologists, uh, each of which back then in the 80s probably had an hour with each patient uh, doing nothing but counseling. So, um, and in those kind of cases, you're doing MI with CBT and maybe some psychodynamic therapy, and it's kind of like it's all, you know, fused in there. Um, and you can go to pretty, you know, deep lengths. So how do I do it, right? How, how am I going to, you know, put this in? I mean, I got, like I said, I have a timeline. I got a timeline that's similar to you guys. So it, it, there's, a, there's a few little tidbits that I do. One is, um, first of all, again, back to that diagram with the four processes, engagement is, is the first Thing. You need that before you need anything else. And if you get engagement, you can say uh, at some point if you reach a time bound, this is interesting. Uh, you know what we're talking about here, and I'm, you know, we're reaching a time boundary. I'm wondering, do you mind if we have uh, another conversation about this? You know, I don't know, in a month or two. Um, and I try to also pair it with a, you know, potentially a vaccine, uh, uh, Vexero or uh, uh, the flu shot or, or indeed HPV, you know, this, that, those are wonderful opportunities, not just for vaccines, but to say, hey, I just want to check in with you about this again. Um, and then you can kind of carve out a little bit more time. Uh, sometimes it's brief interactions, but multiple brief interactions over time. Um, and with each interaction, it's also something that helps uh, uh, cultivate even further engagement. So I have some, I see patients all the way up to 21, and I have some 21-year-olds 21, 21 who I feel sad that I'm going to let them go, and they feel sad, and they're like, you know, and I, you know, I just, I just feel for them because they're going to have to start from scratch uh, with someone else. So, um, and the other way, or just to kind of talk about it a little bit more in terms of um, uh, the nitty-gritty details about billing is, you know, I use that counseling thing, uh, you know, the counseling uh, code a lot uh, combined with the, you know, vaccines, which are a separate thing. Um, you know, when I, when I talk about this, and I'll document it, you know, I'll kind of, you know, I'll spend time talk, documenting these are the positive things of his behavior, negative things about his behavior in his mind. This is where he is um, in terms of what he wants to do and, you know, that kind of stuff. So I document that I've counseled for that time. Um, if you have the capability of, uh, you know, uh, modifying your timeline, that's also great. Um, that obviously is helpful. So uh, with some patients, if I'm seeing them on a busy day, uh, I'll have them come back for follow-up, but then if it really is a prolonged conversation, I'll think, you know what, I'm going to schedule you 
at this time when I'm, you know, let's say coming a little early and I give them a full half hour or something like that or 45 minutes to, to talk to them. Um, so those are, those are ways that we kind of get around it. Um, the other tough thing is when an opportunity, opportunity presents itself. MI works best when there's ambivalence. So all of a sudden it presents itself, but it's a sick visit. And you've got three other sick visits you know, piling up. So, um, and I have to admit that can be a challenge. Uh, I try my best to engage them as much as I can, get them back in the fold. Um, uh, and so there's a little bit of, uh, there's some cons to that. People wait. Uh, people wait anyway. I mean, that's the system is, you know, <laughs> most health systems in the center are not working as optimally as they should. So, uh, but yeah, sometimes that has to I, I just actually have one thing to say. And, and I'm, uh, one is I should mention this resource. It's a wonderful, wonderful, awesome resource. And also because I noticed that uh, on the participants, there is a Robert Schwartz. So uh, Robert, um, I don't know if this is the same person, but I know that there is a Robert Schwartz that created the Change Talk app uh, with Cognito and the American Academy of Pediatrics. It's available for free uh, from uh, both on Android platforms and on uh, Apple platforms. And it is an amazing resource. And I uh, constantly uh, present it to medical students. And I've actually found anecdotally that the medical students who do go along with going through that app uh, end up doing better on their motivational inter interviewing offices. So I highly, highly rec recommend it. It's a very simple name, Change Talk. That's it. Uh, app. And what it is when you when you download the app is it's a relatively involved case of you playing the role of a provider, an avatar. You know, you, you, there's an avatar for you, and then there's a mother and a, I think a nine or ten year old boy who's struggling with weight, and um, it goes you through the conversation step by step by step, and it's it's wonderful. So it's uh, it's a great resource uh, to help get your feet wet. MI before you start using it with patients. So I just wanted to put that out there. I'm not sure if you're the Bob Schwartz who, or if you're another Bob Schwartz, but it, I, I, I had to mention it anyway. <laughs> that is great, Dr. Saha. Thank you for sharing that. We can even send that out in an email to our group. That sounds like a great yes. app. And I just want to yeah, thank you yeah. again for an excellent presentation and uh, really um, to also thank the Pennsylvania Department of Health for the funding that made this webinar possible. It was really a great, very timely topic. And um, if anybody had a question for you, Dr. Saha, maybe we can have them email us and we can um, follow up with you if that's okay. Um, that's totally there are additional fine. questions yeah, after, after the webinar. Um, but mm -hmm. at this time, this, this concludes our webinar. I'd like to thank everyone for participating and wish you um, a safe and joyful summer.